gentlemen, we are back. Gnostic Media's Unspun, episode number 117. Mark Gordon Brown returning with us today. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Um, sorry for the uh, slight delay there getting started. We had a little glitch. I had a setting uh, set incorrectly, so hopefully everything is broad, uh, broadcasting correctly now. I wanted to start off before we dive in to say that uh, we have the new version of the new version nine of the uh, brain database up on the Gnostic Media website, and that is under the uh, <clears throat> the uh, brain tab up there on the website, and I was just trying to pull it up there. Looks like the website is uh, taking a little bit of time to load there today. Also wanted to uh, say thanks to a couple of people. Um, Ted for uh, sending uh, his donation checks every week or every couple weeks. I really appreciate that. I know I haven't said thank you to you. Uh, Holly and I also have a new channel up called uh, Logos Media 2, T-O-O, and uh, we've been promoting that. We also have a Patreon account now, finally, for those who want to support uh, the show and our work and our research and uh, you know the book that Holly and I are writing. And uh, let's see, the, the website, again, is slowly uh, being updated to say Logos Media on everything. I apologize for the confusion on that for people who are, uh, haven't gotten the word on that. But uh, yes, it's slowly converting over to Logos Media. We're just moving away from the old title and the old stuff and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, we already have a, a troll in here. I was just watching the the argument with this guy a few weeks ago who was uh, threatening to murder my family and stuff, and they like to claiming that I'm an agent for um, not selling the anarchist agenda somehow. But uh, yeah. anyway, so uh, we're also uh, working on, we're going to continue the show tonight uh, that we started last week, Mark, on, oh goodness, on weaponized rapture which is a really interesting topic we had quite a few people watching the show last week and taking interest in it and uh whatnot so anyway thanks for coming back thanks also to the Ooh, audience cool. yep sorry and thanks to the audience for uh all the support over the last week and everything and uh anyway thanks mark for for rejoining us you're welcome and i'm um, glad to be back um i've had a, a few people um show interest in this and um uh, message me and stuff and we've continued and, and try to try to speak up just remember you're very soft spoken yeah is is this okay yeah that's can much better me? thank you can you hear me yeah uh, just so, make sure you speak up because when you get into your normal pace you get softer again so just try to keep yeah, it strong um i maybe should state to people that i do have a, a condition called myasthenia gravis and um it affects my muscles and my speech sometimes so it's that's that's what causes it but um can i can i ask you to try you know to sit a little more center in the camera there mark sorry yes yes there no you problem. Go. so we'll just uh, uh bear that in mind people and uh i'm not gonna let it stop me because i haven't let it stop me anything else <laughs> yeah thank you for pushing and uh, we're going to uh go ahead and um continue this delving into whether or not this rapture deal is uh some kind of weapon or not i happen to believe it possibly is and uh i think that everything i'm presenting will point to that and hopefully i can get a whole bunch more people on board with uh this research and uh delving into this and exposing exposing this and uh well i do you want me to do a like a little recap or something, Jan? Well, sure. Why don't yeah? Why don't we start off by doing a little recap of uh, what we covered last week, so people know where we're at, and they can go back and they can catch part one of this. And uh, thanks. Uh, looks like I belong in the kitchen is joined us tonight. Hopefully, we get a lot more people in the chat. Boy, the chat is usually going pretty well by now, but I uh, only have uh, one person in there. Welcome, and I uh, got. Uh, few dozen people watching so far hopefully that'll grow qu pretty quickly here but uh yeah let's do a little recap and we'll we'll dive right back into it okay um last week we went into where this whole notion of the rapture came from was basically um came out of england uh from a guy named uh, uh nelson uh, john, uh, john nelson darby 
and he was associated with the Plymouth Brethren. And we went into um, uh, a little bit about Alistair Crowley and how he was sort of the flip side of rapture doctrine. And then we went, we sort of skipped up a little bit into the 60s and 70s, talked about Vatican II, talked about the rise of the charismatic movement in within U.S. Uh, US uh, and uh, uh, European churches. And um, then we went on to um, talking about Hal Lindsey's book, Lake Great Planet Earth started talking about some of the films that were made and uh, brought out for churches in the 70s, like uh, A Thief in the Night, and then uh, talked about a little bit about some little side ones that are going to play into the whole uh, snowball that's become this sort of rapture uh, in time. Uh, right. And, oh, thank you, uh Giuseppe for the $25 uh, donation there, and uh, thanks for the name change. He says, great work to you two, and congrats, congrats on the name change to Logos, Jan. Thank you, Giuseppe. Much appreciated for that. Thanks, Giuseppe. And uh, so then we um, uh, sort of um, ended out the show. I know, you know, this is just a recap, so we're skipping a lot, and please go back and listen to the whole show if you missed it. Um and then we sort of ended the show talking about how Orson Welles had narrated uh, two films uh, in 79 and 1980. One was um, a film uh, based on uh, um, Hal Lindsey's work about the rapture and the tribulation period from a, a Christian Zionist point of view called uh, Late Great Planet Earth. And the other film that Orson Welles narrated was about um, the prophecies of Nostradamus, which is um, <clears throat> who's where, the man who saw tomorrow. The man who saw tomorrow. Yes. And that's where, um, that's where um, the whole, the sort of uh, the rapture doctrine sort of started mixing with uh, uh, new age beliefs and stuff like that. And that's around 1980 and we're up to uh present when uh, Reagan got elected and the whole moral majority thing and Reagan who has so his church the church he went to sort of links back to the Plymouth Brethren who we uh, dealt with last week which are res sort of responsible for the spread of this rapture doctrine and Reagan he uh, well of course when he was in office he said things like he thought he would be the president who saw Ar Armageddon. He uh, got caught on mic uh, doing sort of like a weird cosplay thing of, of uh, uh, where he was sending an attack to the Russians or something like that. His mic was live and he didn't know it. But I tend to think maybe he did know it and they're just putting that out there for public. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, third eye Jedi in the chat here says a lot of people or, or people have made a lot of money off of the rapture BS. And he's right about their rapture creates yeah. another chosen complex. I hate the chosen complex. He says, and I agree with, I agree with you because that that's basically what, it, what it is. It's, and it, it became a thing where it wasn't okay if you accepted um, Jesus and you accepted Christianity and you lived a good life, you had to accept this specific way of believing in, in Jesus, which included Christian Zionism, the belief that Israel had to be in place, and also the uh, belief that there was going to be a rapture and a tribulation and that the church would be lifted up and that after that, 144,000 um, Jewish messiahs, or not messiahs, but uh, Jewish uh, evangelists would all of a sudden appear because God would make them wake up to go and preach to all the sinners who hadn't got the mark of the beast yet in order to, so that they they could uh, 
be spared going to hell after um, after Jesus came back and defeated the Antichrist. And this is the kind of thing that this is the kind of thing that churches were teaching. And, and the thing is, they're not only teaching it to adults, but they were teaching it to very young kids who basically some that couldn't even understand the, the some of the more esoteric and philosophical uh, 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 things ab about rapture doctrine. Well, all they knew is they didn't want to be left behind without their parents and they didn't want to have their heads cut off. And, you know, it's freaking out. It, it's like, it's like a me mental torture to these little kids. Correct. And, and uh, I had, when I told um, uh, a person I knew around here, and she grew up in a very strict re religious family. And I told her I was doing this, doing this talk. And she goes, she goes, yeah, I remember, I remember when they did this uh, show called, uh, they took this movie called Jupiter Rising to the, to, to her church. And that one, um, they were saying that the planets lining up was going to cause a rapture. And she was, she like said, oh, I counted all the days out and I, I found out that I wouldn't be able, I, it would be before I graduated from high school. And I was just in tears because of, I, I wanted to be graduated from high school. So this is like, like, you know, putting this fear on people instead of trying to get them to believe, to believe something to be about truth and, and to, about being good and stuff like that. It was like a faith-based doctrine. Is it Jupiter because, ascending or Jupiter rising? I think it was no Jupiter is Jupiter rising. Jupiter ascending is that Mila Kunis movie. Jupiter rising was. I haven't actually seen this this movie uh, yet, um, um, but it, it's um, it was like a, a church film. It was one of the ones I was on. I've been unable to get. Right. Um, yeah, I was just yeah. looking for it now to show people, and I'm not seeing it. Interestingly. Yeah, it's uh, it it was um, it was one that was uh, played up here in, in Canada, uh, Canada. She saw it in a church in BC. Uh, so that's where, that's where, and she was telling me about this. It's actually the first time I'd actually heard about that particular movie, but you know, it's like, there are so many of these things out there now, and there's even more coming up as we go along. Right. Well, you know, and uh, a few years back, 2012, December 21st, 2012, we had the whole New Age Ascension Theory come out, you know, and it was promoted by people like Terrence McKenna and Daniel Pinchback and uh, Mike, Professor Michael Coe from Yale and, uh, you know, the Jose Arguez, Carl Coleman, etc. <clears throat> and all of this was a whole uh, asc ascension or rapture uh, thing. They just took the Christian, the false Christian rapture, as, as we've been exposing, and repackaged it for the New Age uh, psychedelic audience. And this guy says uh, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, to you know, and Rupert Sheldrake, uh, to take it one step further, Rupert Sheldrake is actually a a uh, fellow of the uh, Royal Society, whom we've been exposing extensively uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, several months, years or whatever, especially the last several months as we've been researching uh, uh, Salem. So, you know, Sheldrake and all of these people were behind all of that stuff. But, you know, they tie and, you know, here's the brand new uh, brain version online. And there's a button right here if it annoys you, this new style, the way it lays it out. But, um, you know, so Rupert Sheldrake tied to the Royal Society and, uh, you know, promoting all of this parapsychology and dog telepathy and all of this stuff. And they, you know, they... You know, he's, he, his publisher is Park Street Press Inner Traditions, which is always a big red flag. But, you know, these guys up at the Royal Society, they're, they seem to always be promoting these, you know, same or similar type agendas. But uh, we can see that uh, Rupert Sheldrake uh, worked with and knew Terrence McKenna. Of course, uh, Terrence McKenna is uh, or was the uh, largest purveyor of the you know, the stoned ape theory, or the, uh, it was actually the time wave zero theory, which I have here. And so he got that from the Omega Point theory, which was started by Pierre 
Teilhard de Chardin, and uh, you know he was a, a Jesuit, a Society of the Jesuits, and uh, involved with Julian Huxley and some of these other guys. But a lot of the intelligence community and a lot of the people that pro- promote the ad- agenda, they really rally behind Chardin to you know promote his his agendas, even if they're you know totally false. But uh, he was also a part of the Piltdown hoax. Which, yeah, well, I mean, yes. That's very important. Well, yeah, well, that's, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up. So let me go back to him. You are correct on that. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the Piltdown hoax was the largest academic scandal in history, at least the largest one so far revealed. And uh, we have that here. But the it was it remains unknown, but sub- suspects have included Dawson, Pierre Tillard de Chardin, Arthur Keefe, Martin A., see uh, Hinton, et cetera. But basically what they did is they they placed a fake skeleton in England and tried to say it was the missing link in uh, the evolutionary theory, and there it was in England. And uh, basically they took a, a baboon skeleton and a human skeleton and mixed some bones together and dyed them in coffee and stuff. And then, you know, this was put out in like 1910 or something like that. And then... Uh, and the, I forget when was uh, when it was exposed as a fraud. If it was the nineteen early nineteen fifties or something like that, but uh, they did tests on it and discovered that it was coffee stains and that it was a mishmash of bones and that all of these guys were together. So here we have this guy uh, Chardin promoting this bogus history, and then you have all of these guys like Terence McKenna who promote these this bogus history. They're, you know, these prior frauds become their, like, idols or the guys they promote most. And so, uh, you know, and then uh, Terence, of course, works with uh, Jose Arguez and some of these other guys that promoted this whole 2012 Agenda too. So what can you tell us about the, the 2012 Agenda and Rapture? Um. Well, for one thing, um, Terrence McKenna's time wave zero. He was always, you know, as well as the software he program he had for it. And he was talking about a novelty point in history that was going to happen on uh, um, December twenty, uh, December, December twenty first, uh, uh, two thousand twelve, and basically. Terence would go always go into this, and he goes, "I think that that's going to be when mankind is going to discover time travel, and it's going to make everything go." Try, all try to speak up a little bit there, Mark. And he's going to try to, and he's going to make everything go all screwy and wacky and stuff like that. So he's he's promoting this idea that the the twenty the Mayan calendar is prophesizing a time. Uh, on this 20, uh, 20, December 21st, 2012 date, where um, time is going to sort of like be split into like all these uh, factions and things like that. And basically what he, what he, what he's saying is that, that, that some people are going to ascend and some people are going to be left in this reality and people are going to be in this reality and that reality and stuff like that. It, it's like, you really have to break down what he's, what he's saying because if you just uh, you just passively listen to him, it's just like oh, you know, it, it goes like that. But if you break down what he's saying, then then look at the rapture thing, apply it to there. It is basically the same sort of thing, just without Jesus, Jesus the Antichrist, and all that stuff like that. Now, other people, there was other people that came along and uh, expounded on his work. And they are too numerous to mention, but they um, there's every conceivable thing within uh, the New Age movement. Um, I really hate using those words, movement, but that's what they are. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, well, it's it's a type of group think, right? Where yeah, they yeah. think that they're independent when they're really, you know, just uh, toting the official line that has been manufactured by SRI and especially with. Uh, Joseph Campbell and the changing in images of man uh, agenda that I've exposed so much of over the years. So it, it basically what's ha- what's happened is these doctrines sort of merge with people like McKenna and the 2012 thing, and um, the, and a lot of these um, 
Oh, there was uh, Jane Roberts back in the 70s. She really, um, uh, with her uh, Sus Speaks books. And uh, the, that, that's where like a lot of the channeling began. And that was one of them. There was a, a, a book called uh, The Law of One by um, an entity called Ra. And that was also channeled information. And these things were coming out just prior to McKenna. Uh, really making uh, making his his uh, voice heard, and so a lot of that, like a lot of these channeled informations, and, and that people would say, okay, um, either angels or Jesus or Mustardamas is talking to me, or aliens or the Pleiadians or the Zeraticulans or that, and then they're telling us what. Jesus actually said, or what Buddha actually said, and then telling us what the um, rapture actually is going to be about, what the end of the world is actually going to be about. Um, and it's further explained in all these, you know, channeling things. And basically, um, basically a lot of them were just ways to sell books. I mean, um, a course in miracles could be tied <laughs> into that. I got um, caught up into that one, you know, and, uh, I'm going to just pull that up on screen in the database here because that's an important one that a lot of people fall into. So, yeah. uh, Course in Miracles, and it pops right up here. So, you know, A Course in Miracles was written by William Thetford and Helen Shuckman. And uh, interestingly, we know now that William Thetford was uh, part of M the CIA's MKUltra subproject 69 and 89. And we can find that in plenty of the, uh, of the official documents and whatnot on MKUltra. But, you know, uh, it's, you know, more of what people aren't supposed to talk about, apparently. So, yeah. And, um, you know, that's that's the thing. Um, you know, during the 80s, 90s, um, you know, if you go to the, the that's back when there was actual brick and mortar New Age bookstores and things like that, not so much like well, go, all over the East Coast, they're everywhere still. And uh, a lot of the bookstores were filled with books on different variations of um, the Rapture doctrine. It was all mixed up with Dead Sea Scrolls, Gnostic Gospels, Book of Enoch. Um, other uncanonized scriptures, um, as well as Edgar Casey got his work got mixed up into it. Nostradamus, Elsa Crowley, Bobosky, Alice Bailey, um, Mother Shipton, um, even Kenneth Grant, and and uh, through him, um, fiction writer H. P. Lovecraft, and all these things sort of sort of meshing, and people were writing books or saying that. Um, and explaining what, say, Edgar Casey actually meant, or what Nostradamus meant, or what Crowley meant, or what Bobosky meant, or what the Dead Sea Scrolls meant, in, or the Gnostic Gospels, Book of Enoch, uh, Book of Julies, and stuff in regards to the, the the rapture. And basically, a lot of a lot of it was was their own theories. And I realize I'm doing, you know, I'm coming up with my my own theories too, but. I'm asking people to go ahead and check mine. A lot of these people were saying, okay, well, I got this information channeled from um, the Pleiadians or the Zeta Reticulans or the Acturians or uh, Jesus or uh, Nostradamus came and talked to me and explained to me uh, what he was actually meaning and things like that. So, you know, if you're going to go by channeled information, it's like, yeah, you can use that as appeal to the authority of this uh, higher being or whatever. Well, like well, you know, I always make the joke with, uh, you know, people who say they channel information. They're channeling from Uranus, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just you know, it it, you know <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> well, you know, it's like it's always, you know, to the Pleiades or something like that. Why not? Why, why shouldn't it be Uranus? You know, you say you're channeling from yeah. Uranus. Yeah, and it's it's it, it, the thing is a lot of it. Some of these things were so ridiculous and stuff like that. I mean, for instance, Edgar Casey was saying that he was talking about Atlantis, but then you have people saying no. Uh, Edgar Casey is talking about what's going to happen in the future and 
Atlantis is just uh, the, the what he's using as a vehicle to do that. So in a way, this whole dispensationalism thing was started being applied to things like Edgar Casey and Nostradamus and Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. I mean, Blavatsky was talking about things she thought happened in the past. And yet people are like, there's like her works ending up in, in books saying it's going to be about a future prophecy of how, you know, that's related you know, to rapture or antichrist I, I, or whatever like that. You know, I'm glad that you brought up Blavatsky because I suspect, and I haven't researched enough to prove this yet, but I suspect it was Theosophy that actually created the entire uh, Christi- Christianity evolved from Egyptian and Mithraic and Zoroastrian uh, and uh, Hindu religions when it, when you understand tartary you begin to see this whole contemporary thing you know across the entire northern hemisphere really and i wonder if uh or i suspect it was madame blavatsky and the theosophist that actually manufactured that whole idea and somebody just wrote uh blavatsky was a jesuit uh there you go bingo you can you know people they can refrain from you know nasty stuff that i can't say on the air but i'll approve the comment there you go though i mean that's the thing it's like there's a big jq but jesuits Jesuits, the Jake is the Jesuit. Right. Question. Well, you know, and you yeah. know, so uh, Pierre Tillard de Chardin that we were just discussing, he was uh, a Jesuit too. Now, I don't have Blavatsky connected to uh, Jesuits. I would need a citation for that. If Sancho can uh, email that to me, if you have a, a a primary or at least strong secondary citation for that, I would appreciate it. You know, but uh, Alice Bailey is in amongst all of these, and they all of this stuff actually. I think it was wasn't it Bailey, uh, yeah, who goes on to create Lucius Trust, and then Lucius Trust from Lucifer goes on to be the foundation, the publishing arm of the United Nations, and so then we have the United Nations promoting all of this Agenda Twenty One and whatnot. But you know, people think that it's not satanic, you know, and these. Earth religions and all are wonderful, but that's exactly what it is. Is asinine as that may sound, not at face value. You really have to get into the the research. I know people love to attack us, you know, for the ideas we promote rather than you know attacking the the research and citations that we lay out. And it you know, it's a, it's a real struggle for people to start you know to to get people to look deeper than just you know attacking ideas. And you know, I, I need to point out too that. I came to this in a roundabout way. Sure, I was I was born to devout Christian parents, but they were devout in an evangelical sense on my mom's side. My grandmother, she was actually a Mormon before, but she moved to a town where there was only a free Methodist church, so she started going there, and that's what my mom was raised in. On my dad's side, my uh, step my step grandfather's father, my step great grandfather, he was very into the Episcopal Church. My grandmother was Lutheran, and my step grandfather he uh, basically uh, gave up on uh, the he gave up on the church because he got so fed up with his father not letting him study, so he was sort of an atheist and. Even growing up in the church, like I did, I start when I left that church because I couldn't handle this whole rapture thing um, and uh, how the charismatics were taking over the church and making everybody like everything go crazy. I started studying other religions and stuff like that. And I've studied occult things. I've studied the Lima. I've studied Gnostic Gospels, Dead Sea Scrolls. Theosophy, all all manner of things like that, and so it, I'm not coming to this as a person who's um, I don't know. Like I said last week, I don't know what I believe yet. I'm on a path, right? And Jan's path well, and I sort of doing the same tra- trajectory now. Right, and we're it, looking at logos and and seeing how it was all co opted and corrupted and hidden and buried. And here's this massive empire Tartary that they want to 
cover up and bury and pretend never existed in just about every history book you read. And then you realize, wait a second, there's probably a tie between Logos and Christianity and this Tartary. And, uh, you know, and this appears to be where, you know, the idea of, of truth as God or Logos or reason or the word came from. And uh, so then we have to, you know, dig really deep into this stuff and, and get into some comfortable ideas that people aren't really willing to consider, you know, and it's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and that, the thing is, I started uh, looking into Fomenko a couple of years ago, and, um, you know, I've been listening to, to um, Jan's show probably since uh, only about 2012, um, but I started getting into Fomenko a couple of years ago, and one of the, uh, the previous co-host of this show and his group over at uh, Post Flaviana there. And I said uh, something about flamenco. They were like, oh, don't go flamenco. Don't go flamenco. And I'm like, okay. Oh, oh yeah. I'm well, you know, and, and I, go I asked my former co-host a question about flamenco one day and he actually flipped out. And that was a huge red flag for me, you know, and he started actually reading the hit piece on Wikipedia that doesn't cite anything. And of course, you know, I mean, you know, fomenko has got 100 books. There's at least 30 in English, you know, and I've yet to see anybody address the citations. They'll pull up, well, this guy, Mazarov, that he cites in the book came up with this idea, so therefore it's all wrong. Or, you know, and he was a Mason or a Jesuit, so therefore the whole theory is wrong. You know, they don't actually look at Fomenko's argument. They use straw man arguments and you know, killing the messenger arguments. They're not using logic and reason, studying the actual work itself. You know, it's like people who attack the Bible and especially the New Testament without even reading it for themselves. And then when you, you know, and I, I'm guilty of it too. I did it for years. I used to write books against Christianity. And then I go in and I read it for myself, not spot reading it like I did previously, but actually reading it all the way through and going, wow, this is one of the most logical books I've ever read. And when you get that it's about logic, logos, logic, you know, and you get that it's about reason and truth and living in truth and honor. If you can see past all of the lies that we've all heard, that's the funny thing is when you actually get in and you read these books for yourself, you realize that everything you've ever heard about them from someone else was a lie, you know, and then it's like, wait a second, you know. And and the thing is, the thing is I, I believe I sent you a thing from the end of the Gospel of John where I can completely debunk uh, one of the, the claims that you speak up to. there. Yeah. I can de- completely debunk one of the claims that your <coughs> former co-host made about, um, um, about um, um, the gospels being mean spirited Roman humor. And that was the end of the gospel. Right. Of John. Well, you know, and it's like arguing that logos or truth was invented by the Roman emperors. It's just, it's like when you get in and you read the work, it's just nonsense. And then you see, you know, this same guy that it was out there promoting. Um, oh goodness, uh, cannibalism recently. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Richard, oh God, I hate yeah, that. you know, and you know, so Richard <laughs> Dawkins writes all these books against Christianity and whatnot. And then what made Joe, or excuse me, what made made the former co-author's book so popular? was uh, this guy, Richard Dawkins, who, of course, is a fellow of, again, the Royal Society. Remember, we were just talking about the Royal Society a few uh, minutes ago with Rupert Sheldrake and these guys. But it was, again, the Royal Society promoting that whole, uh, you know, or Richard Dawkins is a Royal Society member. And then here he is promoting this book to give this false understanding, you know, and I bought it. I mean, you know, I, the guy was my co-host, you know, and I promoted his book for a while. And then, you know, I see that he's seeded this, you know, this stuff throughout my work and, uh, you know, tried to attach this nonsense theory to my valid work on MK Ultra and say, see, you know, the government's doing it here with the CIA and MK Ultra. So therefore, uh, Emperor Titus did this back then, and now, you know, supposedly that proves this this whole theory that logos, reason, truth, or whatever was an was a Roman, uh, uh, you know, a joke of Emperor Titus. And then when you start seeing this, you realize how um, how you know the theory is just nonsense, and it's another one of the attacks 
on logos that the New Testament talks about in itself, you know, and uh, uncommon conspiracies. And this guy's got some funny stuff on his channel. I was checking it out the other day. He's got a really good attack on Morrissey that was cracking me up pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Morrissey is one of these uh, snowflakes that goes around promoting veganism, eugenics, and all of this stuff, and, you know, all this morbid stuff. But he says, yep, no and other book comes... Things. No other book comes close to logos. So thanks for that. And common conspiracies really appreciate you uh, supporting the show and what we do uh, do here. Well, the, the thing the thing is too it, it, this happened to address the the issue of the um, in the uh, book of Revelations and uh, your former co-host. And I'm sorry, dude, but yeah, we yeah, we, yeah, and we don't want to go too far into this, but yeah, sorry, go ahead, just hit this because yeah, you know I, you I don't know, I want I, I don't want somebody getting all litigious or something, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but the thing is, when he would he would uh, uh, brought into it and in saying that uh, um, Domitian Domitian was uh, the um, Domitian was the um, uh, model for the antichrist yes just speak up a little bit there try to he would say say that domitian was the model for the antichrist or one of uh, one of our titus caesar um and domitian was uh, railing against his um his brother and now other people will say that um nero is the model was the model for the antichrist because of the numerology of it now the the thing the thing is um I think it's a little bit more complex than that. And we really don't know. We really don't know um, who exactly the book of revelations was talking about, because I think it's been obscured um, because I think that the whole Roman empire thing is a fiction. that was created right. After. Yeah. You know, and it, it was, what was interesting is I saw someone else mention the other day, that uh, Rome was originally Moscow, and that was someone aside from Fomenko, and that was a more mainstream person. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks, Polygonal uh, Construction, for the $5 donation. He says, Logos, much appreciated for the support. But now what? Now I just lost my train of thought. Jeez. Well, about um, uh, Moscow, Moscow being. Oh, Rome. yeah. You know, and, and then we know that uh, Constantinople was uh, Rome for a while, probably Alexandria for a while. And then, uh, you know, what's interesting is the Christians are blamed for the burning of the library of Ale at Alexandria. I now believe that that is completely false because Alexandria was a part of Tartary, so it would have been a Christian Logos-based region. And then when the Khazars toppled Tartary, this is when all of the old Tartar books, uh, all of the books stored at the Library of Alexandria, etc., were destroyed. So I think... You know, in all probability, there is another cover up there with the exactly. with the library, and I suspect that you know a lot of the remaining religious texts that we have uh, may be uh, books left over from the Library of Alexandria. I wouldn't be surprised if books like the Book of Mormon are left over from that. You know, and. Uh, you know, the, the Quran, uh, a lot of the Apocrypha, et cetera, all of these books that have been suppressed, you know, so, you know, it's, it, I, I think it's just important for each of us to go in and read these and understand them for, for ourselves through the eyes of the trivium. And that's, that's the thing. I'm not, I'm not asking you, Jan's not asking you to go in and say, and, and take any of our word from it. I'm yeah, check check this out. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second, Mark. This guy, <laughs> Sancho, says, the library at, at Alexandria never existed. Read Luciano Canfora. So thanks for the citation on that, Sancho. I hadn't heard that before. If you could send me an email on that, I'd be interested to check that out. Either, you know, I'd be, I'd be willing to think that maybe the library never existed. I also uh, think that if it did exist, you know, the whole story was inverted and it wasn't uh, the Christians who per uh, perpetuated the, the crime. It's like everybody, everybody, we just need, we need everyone out there listening to, to doing their own research, jump in and, and show us what you got, you know, yeah. just well, yeah, really present, pre present the, the research anime says Domitian is, 
someone who was presented as the model of the Antichrist back in 1900 in order to say that Revelation was written after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. You know, so... The, uh, you know this uh, this whole thing may be another scandal. So I, you know, we appreciate any information you have on that. Yeah, and I'm looking. Um, um, there's Lolly. She's trying to look up um, uh, uh, an author, and if anybody knows it, who was on um, uh, Springola's show, Deanna Springola's show, um, who uh, has who had did research into. Um, uh, dispensationalism being um, spread uh, by uh, CIA uh, or, or other intelligence agencies. So I would really like if anybody knows the name of that author, get in touch with me uh, or, you know, through this. Through, or, yeah, they can go to the contact page at Gnostic Media or LogosMedia.com and it. I still have to get the uh, website domain name fully changed over, but if you go to Logos Media, it'll still get you there. Thank you, uh, uh, Gokuchi Chi for the five dollar donation, much appreciated. And so, like, um, but that's that's the thing is that's where where I started really, 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 uh, um, going into the same areas. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about logos and things like that, and uh, so a little bit of a tangent there but it it does all relate it really does all relate to to the, the rapture thing because basically what we're looking at is a lot of people that have ties to certain organizations seem to have spread this rapture doctrine and they're the same ones that are sort of a perverting other things in the past and I, I personally have a theory that um, when uh, they talk about the Judas or the tri- Judas uh, betraying uh, <laughs> uh, Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees and uh, stuff like that, um, and Sadducees, um, um, the scribes, I think, are the Jesuits and the Benedictines and the Paulites and things like that. I can't prove it. I think it, I can't prove it. And yeah, it, but I'm, that's, that's where I'm heading. Yeah. So. Well, you know, I'm, I've been contemplating this theory for the last six, eight months now and I've posted it and, you know, caused some outrage And you and I talked about partially briefly last week with the idea of the old Testament being after the new Testament originally and the two being flipped because mm-hmm. you have to have logos, you have to have thesis before antithesis. So logos, yeah, before or truth, God, reason, etc. Before the antithesis or lies, deception, Satanism at all, um, and then so you you have logos, and then you have Jesus's betrayal of Judas, and uh, you know if you take a step back and look at Judas and the tribe of Judah, well, Judas betrays betrays Jesus. And the Judas, the Judeans, they for their betrayal, they are sent wondering. Well, and then if you look, all of the Jews lost their land inheritance, and they were sent wandering everywhere. So is this the same thing? I think it probably is. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you know, so then that means that Judaism it would be more properly termed Judaism for the betrayal, and this yeah. is why they're constantly associated with the dark arts and with intelligence and with you know, these genocides and plagues and all of this stuff. And, and, you know, they're trying to get back at the other tribes for, um, for, uh, you know, kicking, uh, for, you know, for kicking them out. And, and Holly, uh, just jumped in the chat. She says she's lurking. Uh, she's probably sitting in a, in a, uh, school board meeting right now. So, uh, anyway, thanks hi, Holly. Holly for, hi Holly. Thanks for jumping in the chat. And, uh, Anyway, so, uh, you know, that's just one of my theories on that. But, of course, you know, if you look at, you know, it's okay to be anti-Germanic. It's okay to be anti-Christian. It's okay to, you know, be anti-white, spew all of this stuff. But if you say anything about Israel or Zionism or, you know, what the Jews have been involved with, you're called an anti-Semite. And what's interesting is Semite means Arab, you know. And when you look it up in any old dictionary, uh, it says that these were the Arab people and not... Uh, not Khazars, right? It's a language group. The Khazars spoke a, a language sort of Sla- similar, similar to Yiddish. It was like a mixture like that. It was probably more Slavic, 
um, uh, a Slavic, uh, I mean, his Russian, modern Russian wasn't actually around at that time, according to traditional history. Um, uh, Church Slavonic was what, uh, um, uh, uh, what uh, the old uh, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox uh, scriptures and stuff were written in, just as Hebrew was only a written language originally. So uh, that's a little bit... Well, you know, here, to understand, but. here's something we discovered the other day that it was the traders, T R A D E R S, who debra- who developed uh, Hebrew or Yiddish, so that they could trade in secrecy and and hide what they were saying from the other groups, and that and a, then what's that? That was a really good video too, by the way. Yeah, and then uh, and then so traders is uh, also traitors, T R A I. You know, A I T O R S. So trade the traders were traitors. So they they would betray your own group and do these back you know back deals you know as we call them backroom deals or whatever. So uh, you know it, it, you're not allowed to you know essentially discuss any of this stuff you know publicly without being labeled one of these things. But of course they can bash on white uh, Christian Germans all day long. And then, you know, these people are supposed to cower and take it all. And it's, 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 it's just a shame too, because it's, it's like, it's a, it's a top, it's a top down thing, you know? Um, And there's a lot of innocent people on that, on the, and the ranks of what are called Jews that get caught up into all this, you know, that is as well. So I, I need to point that out um, just because, you know, I, I don't want anybody to, to misunderstand what we're saying because people are so easy to jump on this and misunderstand it. Correct. We're, they're so yeah. emotionally driven these days. People think with emotion rather than looking at facts. Yeah, and you know, it's just, just the you know, you get people that don't actually read what you're saying or listen to what you're saying. They yeah. dissect it apart. And Check this out. So Sancho has picked up on something that I think we've mentioned on the show a few times in the past. He says Hebrew is an invented language, as Latin and classical Greek. And now I agree with that. Yeah. And I, you know. Uh, you know, reading Fomenko and you see Tartary in this stuff, it looks like at the collapse of Tartary, they manufactured these these languages to give credence, and then they called them dead languages. You know, I think they were just manufactured lock, stock, and, and barrel. And yeah. it looks like we have a, a troll in there, uh, Haas, unfortunately. You know, some people are actually so stupid that they think that they can tell somebody's uh, background by the last name, you know, it's actually a religious belief by denying logos. So calling, you know, someone whose great grandfather, you know, was Ashkenazi or whatever, and that makes them an Ashkenazi. No, that's not how it works there. You know, that doesn't make someone Jewish. What makes them Jewish is denying logos. That's why the entire New Testament is uh, about Jesus going around converting people to Christianity. It's not, you know, and we just discussed the, you know, the Judas's betrayal and Judea, etc. You know, people have to, you know, I know there's these trolls and stuff out there and they're, you know, they're of very minimal intelligence and they, you know, are paid to to post these things. But, you know, when you, you start realizing that it's about a belief system that denies logos, it rejects truth. It rejects yeah. that truth even exists. And once you get that, then you can start thinking more clearly. It's like people think that, you know, Christianity is a Jewish invention and whatnot. You know, it's like, okay, so living in logos, truth and honor, supporting your family, community, etc., is supposed to be a Jewish tradition when the Jews constantly attack Christians and Christianity, kill Jesus, etc., but it's a, it's a Jewish invention, we're told. You know, and so... I would even go so far as to say... And I'm going out on a limb here, but uh, I think if you would go take the Gospel of John and the Gospel, maybe the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospel of Matthew was definitely writ- written to Judaize Christianity, as was the uh, 
Gospel of Luke was written to Latinize Christianity. So I am not really sure at the exact starting date and people, the, the problem is they're not, a lot of people, a lot of people, if they're not familiar with this show and some of the other things you've talked about, uh, or they're not familiar with Fomenko's work, then maybe some of this stuff is going to get by people. Yeah, try to try to sit up and speak a little bit louder. You know, you're coming yeah. across pretty softly there. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of. <laughs> if you if you stay sitting up, you you should be able to pull it off a little bit better. I think if you lean back, you you tend to get a little bit quieter there. A little bit quieter, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of one of the um, hurdles for us to to present this information about the rapture and logos is okay. A lot of the stuff you know historically probably just isn't true. It just is just not. Right. Um, yeah. So you know, 80% of everything you've ever learned is probably BS, you know? Yeah. So if you go back to um, what I was, uh, what was it? Sancho um, was talking about, about Latin, Hebrew, Greek being uh, manufactured languages. Also it's even, even people in the, um, some of the people in a mainstream view English as a manufactured language, what was spread through things like the King James Bible, uh, the works of Milton, and uh, the Shakespearean, Shakespearean uh, canon. Um, uh, Italian supposedly is a manufactured language through the works of, um, of um, Dante Alighieri, Russian, modern Russian, another manufactured language through the works of Pushkin. Uh, and you can find these correlations in all, all a lot of the modern languages. Um, and so that's, that's another thing we need to, to, to look at when we're proceeding with all, all of these things, trying to um, unravel this big ball of yarn or whatever it is. It is you know, it's it, like it's, when you were a kid really, and you would, it's, it's like when you were a kid and you would cut up the, cut open the golf ball, you know, and it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It just keeps on coming out and it's, um, but we're probably going to need to get back to the, um, sure. Let's, let's hit this outline. The, um, you're you're yeah, cutting so, out a bit um, there. I don't know. Mark, okay, Mark, is, is you're this, cutting out a bit. Do you have anything else running in the background? Uh, I shouldn't. I, oh, damn, my head face. Yeah, just yeah. Make sure anything else that might be using up any uh, bandwidth is closed because you're getting a bit glitchy there. I know Canada is renowned for having crappy internet. Oh yeah, it's like oh they they still go by bandwidth here. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like it's it's it's, it's totally ridiculous. Um, but um, so. We were talking, um, we were back there talking about uh, different people like in the New Age movement, um, mixing rapture doctrine with Dead Sea Scrolls, Gnostic Gospels, Book of Enoch, Edgar Casey's work, Nostradamus, Crowley, Bulbowski, and stuff like that. Um, at that same time during the 80s, there was a rise of um, heavy metal and its counterpart within uh, 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 the evangelical Christian community, which there was a, a lot of um, uh, Christian heavy metal punk, but more so heavy metal. And uh, this sort of uh, started uh, the heavy metal and the Christian metal started uh, feeling this whole satanic panic that was coming up. And um, so it was basically increased attention on Satanism and also the Lovecraftian mythos. It's not openly stated, but believe me, it's there. And if you know anything about Lovecraft and you look at that time period and what was being on album covers, both uh, by heavy metal artists and Christian heavy metal artists, um, there was like a lot of Lovecraftian stuff going on. Also at that time, there was, the, it was like, especially in 1984, of course, um, 
there was a, a further imposed fear of Big Brother and a little a little bit uh, a little bit of a Brave New World uh, paranoia going on and stuff. Which I mean, there's reason for it, but still, it, it sort of adding it. It started becoming all mixed up with um, Rapture, uh, the s- satanic ha- uh, satanic panic, and all that. Uh, of course, we still had Reagan in office uh, talking about how he thought he was going to be the president that um, hosted the end of the world. <laughs> I, mean, I, guess, I mean, and that's the only way I can describe it because it got really wacky. And so then all of the, uh, uh, they had like all those talk shows back then, like Oprah, uh, Sally Jesse Raphael, Geraldo, uh, and Phil Donahue. And throughout the 80s and the 90s, and they had shows on the Satanic Panic and stuff like that. Um, you know, Zena LeBay, uh, Michael Aquino, people like that were appearing on, on these talk shows. Michael Aquino kept on going on, saying how he was the inspiration for Damien in the Omen movies. And then they would fight with the Christians. And then there was some high school students that basically thought that they were Satanists, but they weren't uh, LeBayan Satanists, which is just sort of like a Nietzschean, weird hippie, you know, counterpart to hippies, right? It was like a Nietzschean, um, Ayn Rand type of thing with a cosplay sex added to it. And uh, so that was happening. That was happening at that at that same time and sort of the whole rapture thing sort of died down in a big way within the churches and they were more concerned with uh, the whole satanic panic at 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 the at the time uh, basically making sure that their kids weren't listening to the wrong kind of heavy metal and were listening to christian heavy metal and uh and weren't getting involved in Satanism. And there was a few high schoolers that are, you know, killed their friends and stuff because they thought that Satan was going to help them rule, have them rule in hell with him and stuff like that. And it just got, it just got really, really weird. But, you know, it's, you can't, you can't singularly blame say um, the Church of Satan or the Temple of Satan, like Michael Aquino, for this, you have to also place some blame on the evangelical churches because they did their part to spread this um, weird religion of uh, Satanism that, uh, you know, was partly a mix of um, LeVayan Satanism and uh, Hollywood's uh, Stuff yeah, you know, and, uh, look let, let me uh, jump in right there, Mark, you know, because when we talk about Satanism, a lot of people have a really hard time with it. You know, they first off, they don't grasp that, you know, if one lives in truth and you walk, do your best to walk, live in truth, think in truth all the time, check things, uh, etc., that this is Logos, and then the antithesis of that would be Satanism, anything that's based on lies, deception, hurting others, you know, intentionally without, like, it being a self-defense cause, etc., cetera, uh, mass genocides, whatnot. All of this stuff is Satanism, uh, preying on other people, sophistry, uh, all of these things are Satanism. And then, you know, what people have to grasp is just because you don't believe Satanism is real doesn't mean that Satanists aren't real, and that doesn't mean that other people out there don't believe this and don't do these things and don't promote deception and lies and manipulation and control and hurting of others, etc. So once you grasp grasp what these concepts mean, then you can start to see it. It's like, you know, people in, you know, in every book that I have on witchcraft, <clears throat> except for the ones written in the 1600s, maybe, uh, they all start off by ridiculing witchcraft and, oh, it's so ridiculous and it was just herbalist and healing. No, it wasn't. I mean, if you look at the witch's cauldron, you know, the bubbling brew and all of this, this was created as a poison. These were poisons that they were creating to kill and harm people. And, and many children were killed. There's a lot of legal reports from the 1600s of this stuff. But if we just presume that it was all just, you know, misplaced fantasy and they really didn't get it well you know and the puritans or the people of the time they were so ignorant and stupid the the english were so ignorant and stupid 
if you approach it like that, you really miss it. But if you get that it's anything that's against natural law, truth, if they're, you know, hurting people, poisoning them, using mercury and cinnabar to to poison and create plagues and, you know, and this sort of thing, then you get that this is what witchcraft is. You know, vaccines today are a form of witchcraft. And when you get that, when you get the larger picture, then you can't sit there and make idiotic arguments that, uh, you know, that witchcraft doesn't exist or that Satanism isn't really, you know, so many people just, you know, uh, dismiss the idea of Satanism when it's bomb when you're bombarded with it every day, all of this, you know, hypersexualization and TV, all of the pornography, all of the, uh, the attack on logos and, and, and Christianity, all of the, you know, uh, social justice warrior stuff that's going on out there. That's not based in truth. All of that we could consider Satanism, but you have to get to a point where you actually study and learn the terms, aren't afraid to read the New Testament, the Bible on your own, etc., you know, and other, you know, religious texts for that matter, and understand them on your own, and then you can begin to understand the concepts. But if you, you know, refuse to study these things, then you're not going to have any concept, and you go in blind, and then all, all you're left with is ridicule of the ideas themselves rather than trying to understand and grasp them. Exactly. It's, it's just, and the thing is, and we need to really hammer it home again by Christian. We're not talking about all those people you used to know growing up. We're just not, this is something completely different because they don't know this stuff either. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this show to show one to show specific types of Christianity that are just based on wackiness. I mean, just and manipulation, for, you know, I mean, these people bless them, bless them and bless their hearts for like wanting to be that. But, you know, they were sold something that just isn't true. Right. And we're, you know, so when Jan says Christian, Forget about the, those other people. This is something completely different. What he's talking about, yeah. And that, and that's one of one of one of the main reasons I, I agreed to to present this evidence because people are just not getting getting that. And maybe maybe this will help them to get it because from what people think of now in society. They believe that Christians, for the most part, are either Catholics or people that believe they're going to disappear one day and right when Jesus comes back. Right, you know, and <laughs> uh, and all they do is they sit there and they ridicule it. I mean, very few, you know. And it took me a long time to get over this this prejudice too. So I do understand it as much as I rail on it. I suppose that's why I rail on it so much is that you know the trivium forces us. Okay, so. It forces you to think who, what, where, when, why, and how. Have I gone through all the grammar? Did I read all the evidence? Well, if I'm attacking the New Testament, if I'm attacking Christianity, have I read the New Testament before I attack it? Okay, now that I've actually read it, what can I attack in it? And then when you read it, you realize, oh my God, this is one of the most logical, well-written books I've ever read. And, And that's Aside from it being rewritten and retranslated and everything, you know, hundreds of times to try to obscure it, you know, so then it's like, okay, you know, and then you realize everything that you were told about it is a lie. Why are they keeping us from it? You know, like I'll get trolls who attack me for saying that the Bible, especially the New Testament, is like your owner's manual. It's like the Trivium shows you how to find truth and the New Testament shows you how to live in truth, right? And then... Once you get these things and you start piecing them together, then you can, you know, you can see things and try to, you know, walk and live in truth. And the more you do so, the more you can see those who are trying to deceive and to, you know, trick you and your family. And then as men, the better we are able to protect our families, you know. And so, you know, and it's, this is all key stuff, but people are, to such a fallen state that they think that they can know better. And they you know, the most common argument I hear from people that are so spiritual against Christianity is that they are smarter than all of those Christians who've actually read the book because they have not read it, you know? So they start from a position of ignorance and saying they're, they are smarter than everybody else who read it and studied it. 
And that's exactly what that's exactly what goes on. And I I find that with almost everything is like, um, no matter what book, whether it's Quran, and it's the Book of Mormon, the Maharabata, the Gnostic Gospels, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, my God, back in the '80s, I had people like all the time saying, "Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's like if are saying this, or if we actually knew what they were saying, they would be saying this. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, even then, it was like when I was and more involved in, say, New Age and occult type things, when people would say those things, I would be like, seriously? You never even read the damn thing. Right. You hardly read anything. I mean, some of these people, they hardly read anything, and they just go spouting about it. It's well, like, it's it's like when you open the Quran and line six of page one, or is it line seven of page one? I forget. It says, show us the true way, the, the path that is true and righteous or whatever. And so right there, you know, on the first page of the Quran that it's a book of the right-hand path. It's it, It's a book of the right hand of God, so to speak. And so it starts off, you know, arguing, you know, show us the way of, you know, those who are not fallen. Yeah. And, and it's like they also misquote it is like um, um, and they say Muhammad is his only prophet. It does not say that. Correct. I mean, it, 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 it actually holds all prophets at the same level. And it says and it names dozens of prophets that. You know, I think it, Jesus, uh, Muhammad is named four times, and Jesus is named like I forget twenty something or something like that. I forget. It's a lot. I have twenty four. I, I have my copy behind me over there, but it's mine's I'm upstairs. Like, Otherwise, I'd show it. I have a pretty nice copy of it. You know, and I also constantly tell people to read the uh, the Book of Mormon. You know, and I thought that the Quran would be the most taboo book to talk about. No, 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 no. no. The Book of Mormon is like exponentially more taboo to talk about than any other. You know, when you get in and read it, it's mostly talking about, hey, you do this bad behavior, you're going to fall into iniquity and be a slave. You don't do this behavior and you do this behavior, your family will live and survive on and you'll be free. And it's like, okay, well, that's pretty common sense. You well, know? It, a lot a lot of the opposition comes to the, the stuff after it was sort of... Uh, mucked up from uh, well well yeah they well they they killed smith and then the u.s army took over deserta and the the whole country the whole united states was almost a mormon country and Mm -hmm. then this whole western part of the united states was a mormon country called deserta and the the u.s army came in if you look at u.s federally owned lands and deserta the map lays over perfectly yeah you know exactly you know, and then you start getting the picture. But you know, anyway, we're we're going way off here. Yeah, Let's get back on. Yeah, Sorry, I, what are we on at uh, slide sixty five here? Uh, sixty five. Yeah. So basically, um, as uh, the eighties uh, and nineties went on, we basically started having a bunch of people throughout the world, and in the nineties, it started being on social media and early internet and stuff like that thinking that they're stopping the rise of Big Brother or the Antichrist, but actually what they're doing is helping to create a technocratic safe place state as Huxley blueprinted in um, A Brave New World. So basically, we got all these people, both in Christianity and in the New Age movement, basically trying to stop this Big Brother sort of... uh, uh antichrist from coming along but really they're what they're what they're promoting for is either a transition into like a a brave new world uh state or uh uh, waiting for a brave new world state after um, jesus comes and defeats the antichrist and so this is basically more so where we're at where we're at currently however there's more there's more to the story of the manipulation than that but that all sort of just started like at that point at that point um uh, somewhere between the late 80s and into uh when uh, uh into into the 90s it sort of started morphing into this thing where uh, people are actively trying to stop the rise of big brother but in doing so 
uh, promote uh, uh, Aldous Huxley sort of Brave New World type of thing, whether it be a Christian one or a Burning Man type one or, a, you know, ecstasy type one or whatever. It, it all is all basically the same thing where uh, it's going to be a, a, a safe place state where they're going to be protected like little babies for uh, thousand years or whatever to come and there's going to be peace and there's going to be no war and blah 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 like that and uh, and but it's going to be something where other people are helping them promote it instead of coming to logos and truth and being a part of actually creating it just by being a, a decent person <laughs> which and just just trying to be a decent person. I mean, just the, just the act of trying to be a good person all the time is tough enough, you know. Yeah, and and that's and that's the thing. That's the thing where it got like really, really bizarre like that. And this is where we're at now. But they kept on with the rapture type movies and uh, the propaganda and stuff like that, same as they were doing before. Now, in 1991, there was a really weird movie, and I'm on slide um, uh, 6667. Sure. Um, and uh, it starred Mimi Rogers and David Nicomi from the X Files. And that's, we're not even going to go into that, but X Files sort of is a part of the snowball, too. But this film, The Rapture, that came out in 1991, was a soft part soft for porn and part rapture doctrine evangelism. It has to be one of the weirdest films I have ever seen. This um, Mimi Rogers characters plays this girl that sort of went around with a, a, a older man and they would uh, uh, go around to, to swingers and uh, she met her future husband in the film was played by David Duchovny and they both become Christians after uh, during a uh, little sex party, Mimi Rogers saw a tattoo um, on the back of one of the women at the sex party that had uh, uh, the mystery of the pearl, which is uh, supposedly um, what uh, uh, another metaphor for um, the, the knowledge of the rapture was on this girl's back while they're at the sex party. And then uh, she uh, became a Christian, married uh, this other person. She met at a sex party. They had a little girl. Uh, the, her husband and her little girl were both killed. So at the end, when the rapture was coming, she didn't go up to heaven because she was so pissed at God. And I'm sorry, it's a spoiler, but it's a really bizarre <laughs> movie. And I don't know how else to tell you about it. And if you want to watch it, go ahead. But it's really weird. And I usually like weird stuff, but this one is like even weird for me. And so uh, basically um, she meets up with, somehow she's in a prison and meets up with the girl with the tattoo on her back again. And then the girl with the tattoo on her back, she goes up to heaven in the rapture and stuff. But Mimi Rogers is like in purgatory and her daughter's coming to her, oh, please forgive God for killing me or whatever like that, or you can't go to heaven. And she's like, I can't. And she goes, well, you know what that means, mommy, don't you? You're just going to have to stay here forever. So um, basically, she ended up in a state where she was neither in heaven or hell, but like just staying there because she wouldn't forgive God for, quote unquote, killing her daughter when it was actually a uh, a gunman or whatever like that did it so it's, it's just really bizarre movie but what's well, you know it's because people don't understand the concept of choice <laughs> and this is something that's constantly promoted by the anti-christian community essentially and it's like well how could god allow <laughs> bad in the world and how could god allow you know evil things to exist in the world and then when you actually read the book and it's by choice you're allowed free will. You can do good on the right or evil on the left. And so when you murder and kill and do usury and plagues and sophistry and lying and deception, that's all stuff that's on the left. But, you know, it's all based on free will and the choice 
of doing good, the right thing, the right thing, the righteous thing, the right hand, or doing the left, the evil, the the dark. That's why it's called the left-hand path. So, you know, people get caught up into these left-hand path religions, et cetera, because they're earth religions and whatnot, and not realizing that, you know, pan, <coughs> pan and all of these were, you know, the, the gods of the of the garden, so to speak, that promoted the drugs and whatnot. But the, that's the goal of these groups is to sell these earth religions and get us off of what is in truth and living in truth. And the more the more they get society to live a lie, the more we see these social justice warrior issues taking over. And um, this film was actually marketed in two ways. And if we can uh, post uh, slide 67... Sure. Uh, yeah, I've already shown it a couple of times. Go ahead. Yeah, and um, so in one one way, it sort of looks like a religious thing, and and the other, the other p- promotional poster, it looks like a sexual. Yeah. So one is like the rapture in a spiritual sense. The other one is a rapture, as in like an orgasm. Yeah. So I, I, there's like a lot of strange manipulation going on with this film, and I'm quite not sure what to think of it yet, but. I know, well, especially if it has David Duchovny on it. He is in X Files. X Files, of course. I mean, we don't need to say any more. It's been covered by your show. It's been covered by a lot of other shows that, and anybody in the alter, alternative media knows the story on X Files. So that's where we're going to go here now. Um, before I get to what I have on uh, slide um, 69, I want to also say just after that, in 1993, there was the whole Waco thing with uh, Branch Davidians and a lot of talk about the Book of Revelation, the Book of Daniel and stuff within um, the, the mainstream media due to all the news coverage of uh, David Koresh spouting off all the, the stuff. Now, if you look back before the Left Behind movies were placed out, um, there was of the um, um, Manson, the Manson family trials, which had a lot of talk about the Book of Revelation and them. Now, all so that was 1993. Now in 1994, and I didn't add this to the um, this what I'm going to talk about next to the, um, P, the 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 PowerPoint because I didn't know if we we're going to have enough time to talk about it, but I really think we need to talk about it. Now, in 1994, although it, the book came out earlier, uh, um, like I've said before, I think a lot of things are more. <laughs> to the point when they're presented in a film style of film or television way, more people are going to see them. Now in 1944, ABC did a mini series of Stephen King's The Stand. And um, that has to do with a plague uh, going and having like a lot of people die and stuff like that. You know, and then there was a, the character of Randall Flagg, who is a satanic, uh, a satanic figure, sort of like an antichrist figure, who um, these other people had to defeat, and then God helped them and stuff like that, and then they went into a better life. Now, the thing about um, the stand is this uh, Randall Flagg, and he's also uh, this this the same character as in the Dark, Dark Tower, uh, which. Uh, the Man in Black in the Dark Tower is also Randall uh, uh, Randall Flagg, and in a lot of uh, Stephen King's other books, this Man in Black is there, and he represents a satanic type figure. Now, what's interesting about The Stand, though, is in 1969, and this is very important, the spring of 1969, um, Stephen King released a short story in a uh, uh, a um, magazine. I, I'm forgetting the name of the magazine right now. But in the spring of 1969, it was called Night Surf. Now, in that movie, it was a prelude to the stand where this plague had taken over uh, the world and people were, were dying off. And the plague was ne- nicknamed Captain Trips. Al Hubbard, of course. Al Hubbard, correct. 
yeah, uh, after him. Now in night surf, the um, the character the characters were after the plague had hit for a long time, and they found a person. These teenagers on a beach or twenty somethings on a beach found a person who was dying of the plague. So they had done a human sacrifice, um, a cult ritual using this this plague victim on a beach. So, and that's all this short story was about. Now, if you know anything about the occult, when you do things in say the springtime, the beginning of the year is to cause an increase. Now, this coincides, I believe, with the work that you and Holly are doing with all the plagues and things like that, because I kind of believe that things like the stand um, are tying into that, that whole thing as a social programming and also as sort of a, a chaos magic type thing to cause an increase in maybe a plague type thing in the future or whatever like that. And it's a very bizarre thought, but as we go on to this next movie and that's uh, a very important, uh, our next set of books and movies that's a very well known in Christian rapture tribulation doctrine, it sort of ties into the stand and Excuse me. Also, what, what slide are we on, Mark? Uh, we are on uh, um, slide sixty-nine, okay. and also and also into and it'll also tie into um, your your um, research on to, to plagues and stuff like that. Okay, so in nineteen ninety-five, um, the books in the Left Behind series uh, by Tim. LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, they started coming out and you know, they were going into Christian bookstores. And a lot of Christians were reading them, but it wasn't until later on in the year 2000 when uh, more people became aware of these because um, they started making, making the books into movies. Now, in 2000, um, uh, the first uh, Left Behind the movie was made, and that was starring uh, child actor Kirk Cameron, who was in um, Growing Pains. And that one, basically, it was a story of uh, this journalist, Buck Williams, played by Cameron. And he uh, was covering a lot of things in the Middle East and stuff like that. And then he... Uh, Oh God, I'm blanking here. <laughs> and and then and then the rapture thing started happening, and he hooked up with this pilot, uh, um, it's Ray, Rayford Steele, and then he went back to the pilot's place. This was after the rapture started happening, and they were like trying to figure out what were going on, and they all became Christians, and they all became Christians, and. Uh, were started fighting fighting this uh, antichrist that came to power, and his name was uh, Nikolai Carpathia. And uh, now, what's interesting about this is this is like around you know 1995 when these books are coming out. It's just around the same time as the whole Balkans war was going going on and um, the US was trying to demonize everybody Eastern European. And also um, Nikolai Carpathia, of course, the Carpathian mountains, um, can't neglect that, are in Romania. And so that's like Rome Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're starting to learn more about that. Learn more about that. And also there's that tie to the Lovacian prince, uh, um, uh, Vlad Tepish, Dracul. So it's like there, that, that's kind of going in, into, into that. So it, basically, Kirk Cameron, uh, this pilot, uh, uh, Steele, and his daughter are trying to fight and, and their and their mothers and 
and the, the daughter's and the husband's um, wife's uh, pastor all are trying to stop the Antichrist. And then they have a second movie called Left Behind Tribulation Force. It's more of them trying to stop the Antichrist uh, by giving Bibles to people. And the last one is Left Behind World at War. Now, that one is kind of interesting because in it, um, Buck Williams and the pilot, uh, Rayford Steele, and their daughter, and uh, this other lady that uh, that uh, pilot married after his wife got raptured away and stuff like that. They're all trying to stop the Antichrist. And also the president of the U.S., he started trying to stop this uh, the Antichrist, Nikolai Carpathian. But then they find out that Nikolai Carpathia has this evil plan to get rid of all the Christians by putting uh, a virus in these Bibles that this group is passing around. So all these Bibles are being handed out to all these people that all of a sudden are really devout Christians, even though they didn't get beamed up into the rapture, are getting this weird disease, sort of like the same kind of disease that's in the stand. And they're all like, you know, coughing and, you know, having like, you know, the symptoms and freezing and then a few of them die and stuff like that. And um, then the president of the United States he sends a missile to uh, Nikolai Carpathia's Tower of Babel that he created and blows him up, but he doesn't die and he just sort of like walks out in a fire. But then the daughter of the pilot, who's, oh, <laughs> this is really awkward, I'm sorry. The daughter of the pilot who's now married to uh, Kirk Cameron's play, uh, uh, character, the um, the uh, reporter Buck Williams, who is part of this tribulation force going around handing out Bibles, who also has this disease, she um, they give her she, they give her communion, and she drinks the communion wine, and now that is supposedly the the, the vaccine for the virus. <laughs> it's like a really convoluted story, but it's so bizarre. That this is this is what they're, they're putting out there, and I don't even know how to d describe it because it's so such a weird, weird movie. I just watched rewatched it um, the other the other night, and I'm just like, like, going, how am I going to <laughs> tell people about this because it's just so nutty? So if you watch that one, it's called Left Behind. Um, um world at war it really ties in to all the stuff that you and holly are doing with the with the vaccines and, and the plagues because it's basically got the antichrist starting plagues through like plague laced bibles and then the vaccine is the communion wine and i guess it's trans substantiated blood of christ is is uh bringing people back from this plague and uh that was the last movie in that particular series. Now, in um, 2014, and I will spare you any kind of uh, and like uh, imitation of this guy because altogether too many people keep on doing imitations of this guy. Nicholas Cage was in. Uh, an updated version of Left Behind. And they took out a lot of the stuff about the Antichrist and Nikolai Carpathia and stuff like that and just sort of had Nicolas Cage um, and the, uh, his character, uh, Rayford Steele, and uh, the Buck Williams character um, going around trying to get back to, um, to uh, 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 Rayford Steele or Nicolas Cage's daughter uh, because... Um, both the mother and her her brother were raptured away, 
and it was typical Nick Cage sort of sort of uh, dramatics, real campy and stuff like that. But at the end of it, they used the the Larry Norman's uh, an updated version of Larry Norman's um, "I Wish We'd All Been Ready" that was also used in the Thief of the Night movie um, and that I talked about last week. And I mean, it, this is just really, really bizarre, bizarre, bizarre film. And actually, the the Christian ones were probably a, a little bit less bizarre than the Nick Cage, Nick Cage ones, although Kirk Cameron's acting is really, really terrible. <laughs> so are you, are you saying that Kirk Cameron's acting uh, actually tops Nick Cage's acting? Because Nick Cage, in my humble opinion, is a pretty terrible actor. You know, both of them are pretty much pretty, pretty, pretty bad, but it was just like... It was like the one, the one was like a real cutesy version of it, and the other one was just like... Like, I mean, it's typical Nick Cage. He's just going around like paranoid. His eyes are popping out and bugging off. He's screaming every five minutes or whatever like that. He's reading, reading that each, each line is only like three words or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like really, really bizarre. And I'm sorry that I mangled that synopsis, but it's like, how do you, how do you even describe these movies at, at some point? They get right. really bizarre. And the, you know, we have another one coming up that's even more bizarre. But uh, so yeah. this has basically brought like the rapture stuff to to the world. So it's no longer a secret, which that was one of the big things that like a lot of evangelicals at first were going, well, this is a secret. Nobody's going to know it. Well, basically everybody knows it now, even, even people in you know buddhist and hindu and islamic countries know about this and uh so we got that also um the um the funny thing is about the left behind movie is when it was aired on a, on a satellite tv up here um if you would look at the uh, the things on the the, the the satellite channels you would see you would see Left Behind that was premiering, like, say, on the movie network. And then something like one of the uh, secondary movie channels where play older movies would have something like National Ch Treasure on or the Tom Hanks movies from um, Dan Brown, that kind of stuff. And then uh, on A&E, Discovery Channel, the History Channel and stuff like that, they would have the different um, Signs of the Apocalypse movies on all at the same time. So there's some coordination going on there. I mean, it's got to be. It's just like, right. I mean, it's like you, you can only go coincidence so far. Now, yeah. in 2016, the uh, fourth Left Behind movie uh, came out called Vanished. And it was really targeted to um, millennials. And <laughs> um, it, it was like sort of like... Um, I would say something like um, Twilight for the Rapture crowd, and uh, it also. This Did you is, say Twilight Zone? You cut out there. No, Twilight, like the Twilight movies, but for the Rapture crowd. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry. Yeah, like the like that kind of that kind of genre. Twilight, um, uh, the oh, what's her name? Um, the um, Fault in Your Stars, that type of movie is like filmed in the same kind of style and all that stuff like that. The same kind of dramatic pauses at the end of like little lines they thought were cute. Sure. Stuff like that. And uh, so a girl um, and her little sister and her best friend and a street kid are all left when the girl's mom vanishes and stuff like that. And they kept on making a point of the, the little girl that was left behind saying, I'm 11, I'm 11. So apparently that's the, the cutoff age uh, because her little friend that she was getting ice cream with before was 10 and she didn't get raptured. So right. <laughs> apparently that's the age where you, you got to cut off. And then there was a left behind video game as well. 
yeah, Left Behind video game, which where you had to like fight off the Antichrist. Or, or it, I never actually got the video game. I was tempted to because I saw it at Best Buy for like six ninety nine or something. It's ridiculously low price or something like that. But I never, I never got it because it was like <laughs> my wife was, why would you waste your money on that? It's like for research. And I was right. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Whatever. But, but. It was just too weird. Yeah, you know, yeah, you can get in there and you know spend hours beating up the Antichrist in there. So yeah, and it was all like, right. And so then, then, uh, then, uh, what's really bizarre is the character at the character of Nikolai Carpathia, the Antichrist, is not shown until the very end of this movie, and he looks incredible. The actor playing him. Looks like an older version of the gun control poster boy, uh, David Hogg. Wow, <laughs> he sure does. Oh my goodness, wow. And so that's just like really, I find that like really a bizarre coincidence. Yeah, and, interesting. Uh, well, you know. I, actually, I actually thought that when they had, when they showed him, I thought it was David Hogg. And I'm like going, oh my God, David Hogg was in this movie? Because... I hadn't actually seen that one until I started putting putting this this presentation together. So, I of course had to get it and watch it. I was just like, "Oh, that is too weird." Wow. Now, and there's another set of movies, and these these aren't exactly rapture movies, um, but they they come out of a Trinity Broadcasting Network, and they're the Omega Code and the Omega Code. Uh, the Megiddo, Megiddo, the Omega Code 2. Of course, Megiddo is where Armageddon is supposed to take place on the plains of Megiddo and over in the, the Middle East. Right. The weird part about these movies, it's they focus around two brothers that, you know, it's two stepbrothers that grew up together in England. And uh, I'm not even going to talk about the first one. I'm going to talk about the second one. So in Megiddo, the Omega Code 2, it has these two brothers basically becoming Christ and Antichrist and uh, they fight it out at Megiddo but it just happens that the one who is supposed to be Christ reincarnated is the president of the US (laughs) (laughs) so that's some major mind control stuff going on there. I mean, it's like, what else can you say about that? It's just like, seriously, you can find this on YouTube. If you don't believe this, watch it. But it's really weird. And also, um, the uh, the Antichrist turns into a big Lovecraftian type demon That's funny. to fight the president, of the, the president of the U.S. It's just really, really weird. And you can find them on YouTube and watch them. They're- We're rolling up on uh, two hours here, so we should probably wrap up these last few slides here. Okay, so base uh, basically we're um, going up. Uh, like I said, I think I went into this last week. Well, what I find the one of the problems with rapture, the rapture doctrine, is this. Apart from obscuring this messages of common law and logos in the New Testament, it's also spreading this belief that some major event will, will either make a bunch of people disappear or die instantly, followed by an evil dictatorship who must then be overthrown by Christ in order to usher in a thousand year reign of peace. Now, the reason I'm bringing up things like the stand and stuff like that is because how easy would it be? for people to sell the public that, oh, if a major plague happened, that it was something like the rapture and that whatever government came in to take, you know, take over and take find control, stamp people on their foreheads or implant them with microchips or whatever was, had to be overthrown. And then to place in like, say, oh, say like, oh, that just for say that Putin was the one coming in, uh, getting control and then stamping people's forehead with this mark of the beast things. But then somebody like Trump, uh, like 
oh, he goes in and defeats and defeats him and saves everybody. And then, oh, we got a thousand years of peace under the Trump family. I mean, you know, maybe that could happen, you know, because this is the kind of thing where they're setting people up for this doomsday scenario and stuff like that. You know, you know, it's like we've, you know, we've seen people already, you know, go through the whole thing with Y2K. They thought that was going to be the rapture. 2012, the aligning of the prophets, you know, and it's been mixed into every religion on the planet. And even we have Hollywood having comedy movies about the rapture, making, you know, fun of these people that believe in it. And uh, that it was a movie called This Is the End. It starred uh, Seth Rogen and um, Jay Bacharel and, uh, and James Franco. And basically it was this Hollywood party where all these, all these Hollywood stars w- went to and uh, the rapture started happening and they really didn't even know the rapture was happening. It was stuff that Seth Rogen and Jay Bracharel had went out to get a snicker or a candy bar and Orange Crush, and they came back and it's like people are disappearing and all this stuff. And there's earthquakes and and then people, no, nah, there's nothing happening. You know, everything's fine in here, and they're all token up and party. And then they go outside and they all start like uh, holes start being uh, opened up in the ground and they start being sucked into the ground and demons start going after them. And then there's a whole, a whole thing. There's only uh, Seth Rogen, uh, uh, Jay Batchel, James Franco, Craig Robinson, Danny McBride and Jonah Hill left uh, in this big old t- like massive fortress of a house that James Franco has. And they're like trying to figure out what's going on. And then uh, Emma Stone, uh, who played uh, um, Hermione and uh, Harry Potter, she comes back in and she thinks it's a zombie ev- invasion. She's like banging everything with the ax, but then she thinks they're gonna rape her. So she like runs away. So they're left there again. Then Jay Bacharel, he finally figures out what's going on, that it's uh, the apocalypse happening. He starts reading a Bible that James Franco has, and he's really mangling the whole thing about, about the, the rapture and stuff. And he's going to Revelations and reading some, some nonsense. That he right, yeah, they, there. they love to take you know that out. And I'll listen to people say, well, I love the Bible, everything, or I love the New Testament. Everything is logical in it except Revelation. And when you get... The whole thing from a point of logos and you get you know that it's about truth versus lies etc and then you can see well hey you know if we don't get things together that's you know that description is how things are going there and i mean you can look around and you can see it everywhere but you know it it doesn't it doesn't take a genius and then what you realize is that you know it's people waking up and coming to logos realizing what it's all about that you know, that is the, the so-called awakening or the rapture or whatever you want to call it, but they yeah. take it, but they're taking it away. They're removing it from logos and your own personal struggle to wake up and live in truth, you know, and that we all go through, you yeah, know, and it, some of them just deny it altogether and go the left-hand path. And, and, that, and that's what's, what's happening too in this movie, because it's eventually they tie it into these other things that brought up, like um, there's a scene in it where, um, Jonah Hill is raped by a big old Lovecraftian type demon, but it also rep- that scene also references Rosemary Rosemary's babies. When like he's going, this is not a dream, and then and then they try to then Jonah Hill has this demon inside him, so they try to uh, exercise him via the Exorcist, and they use scenes from like lines from the Exorcist, and then. They kick Danny McBride out of the house because he's eating all the food, and he becomes like a road warrior, apocalyptic type cannibal an- uh, antichrist that's leading this like Scarlet has a Scarlet woman, and like he has like he's like a homosexual like uh, gimp, Channing Tatum as his gimp and stuff like that, and then they try to cannibalize on uh, James Franco, and then they figure. Um, Jay Bacharel had them all convinced that if they just start being good, that they would get raptured. And so 
Craig Ferguson, uh, or Craig Robertson, excuse me, Craig, Craig Robertson, he starts fighting this demon to protect the other ones. He gets raptured. So then they all start talking nice to each other. Oh, oh you're really nice and talking, you know, you know, like, oh, you're a good guy. And like, you know, I like best about you. And he goes, they're going, oh, this, why aren't we raptured yet? <laughs> it's like think of that. And then it's uh, James Franco's getting eaten by these cannibals. Uh, led by this Danny Bride that used to be their friend, and then he starts getting raptured because he did it to um, to uh, um, help uh, Seth Rogen and Jay Bradshaw all get away from this Antichrist Danny McBride, and he starts getting raptured. But then he starts flipping off Danny McBride, and like God's like, oh no, and then they make a point like. Pettiness is a sin. <laughs> you know, so, like that. so he then the cannibals eat him up, which is kind of important to the whole yeah yeah thing because like uh, the fetuses and the vaccines and stuff. But anyway, um, so eventually get the goam yeah. to cannibalize themselves and the vaccines and whatnot. So so these these two actors get uh, raptured up to heaven, and then they're met, met by Craig Robinson. They're everybody's angels smoking up smoking up the best pot they ever had, and then the Backstreet Boys come in and sing a song. <laughs> so so this, I mean this this is a state where where we're at with these. Then. Just uh, there's a Craig Robinson's in another Rapture film, which I have not been able to get my hands on called Rapture Palooza. So I don't really know what's going on. But HTO, HT, HBO television, um, they uh, uh, released a show called The Leftovers, where all of a sudden a bunch of people disappear. And one of the characters in it is a minister who goes around uh, uh, like talking about different people who disappeared or uh, writing up things and po posting them like publicly that uh, it's not the rapture because this person was having an affair, stuff like that. However, as the show goes on, um, there's this, the lead character is a sheriff who then is sort of seen as uh, the Christ figure or the Messiah but one of the episodes actually had um, uh, um, the opening of the film had um, the film, the, the song that I just spoke about from A Thief in the Night, Larry Norman's I Wish We'd All Been Ready, um, being sang by a, 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 a real wispy sounding female vocalist, um, very long, having scenes of a 19th century French Christians that sort of re would resemble uh, Margaret McDowell's uh, circle of believers there in Port Glasgow, Scotland, where all that whole rapture things is supposedly started from. Interesting. So, so basically, that's that's where that's where um, we're at now. So basically, a lot of major players are spreading this sort of rapture rapture doctrine you know that could almost be a tell to be able to start identifying the fakers of this stuff is you know and others are divine grace you know free grace uh antinomianism etc these are all false doctrines and um what i'm currently what i'm currently working on and it's really hard because my Russian is like not like that. Right. As I'm, I'm uh, uh, um, looking at the counterparts of these kind of uh, things that are going on in the Soviet Union and in uh, modern day Russia and that area of the world. I'm currently um, looking into uh, uh, prophecies of uh, Baba Vanga, and uh, she was a Bulgarian. Uh, Blind Prophet, um, and uh, there's another one, a 11-year-old boy who passed away with cancer there, but my concentration at the moment, it, I'm watching a, a TV show from Russia about um, uh, Baba Vanga, it's called Vangelia, and you can get that on YouTube if anybody wants to follow around and see if they can see him, because um, that is proof in this TV show, and it's admitted that 
Russian government, specifically like people like Boris Yeltsin, um, would, would uh, contact her in regards to um, her prophecies and stuff like that. So if we sort of backpedal it a bit, um, maybe maybe she's a plant, maybe she's not, I don't know, but it, it, it works into a whole rise of Bolshevism and uh, 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 Stalin and Hitler and all that stuff like that. So that's where I'm currently where I'm currently going with this stuff, trying to trying to find out where things are are on a worldwide level and more in regards to all these end time prophecies and stuff like that. Because let's face it, with you can control people with fear. And these end time prophecies, whether it be rapture, uh, 2012, Y2K, whatever, control can control people by fear. Yeah, you know, I was a uh, network admin at a company down in, uh, oh, what was it, uh, Santa Fe Springs back in the late 90s. And uh, the whole Y2K thing, K thing coming up, and I was the the senior network admin at the company during all of that and, you know, all the updates and everything that had to be done. And then, you know, uh, January 1st, 2000, nothing happened at all. Nothing. I mean, yeah. all the, all the computers stayed functioning, everything still worked, everything, you know, everything just went on, but, uh, you know, they, they sold a lot of Y2K bug spray at the, uh, you know, the joke spray at the uh, computer stores and whatnot. But, uh, yeah. Is are we at about uh, wrapped up here? Did you have? Yeah, pretty much. I just uh, like, well, yeah. It's 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 pretty much, um, pretty much. That's what I have right now because basically the last thing that really came out uh, was the Le leftovers TV show. Yeah. And, well, uh, you know, at least now there's a handful of us out there that can see this agenda and how they're. They're selling it, and hopefully more pick up to this. Uh, you know, these couple shows that you and I did on this. Maybe we can have you back sometime when you discover more on this uh, subject or any others you're working on. Because you know, we're all trying to figure it out too, and and seeing all of you know, studying Salem. Salem is key, and looking at the Protestant Reformation and all of that. That's going to be key as well. And then you know, we, we can see how the Protestant Reformation was propped up and how these people weren't, uh, you know, weren't following Logos. They were corrupting Logos, and that was the goal of, of Protestantism in general. You got the link on Kuru I sent you, right? The uh, yeah, it, not in front of me, no. But um, I think in combination with the Mercury and uh, uh, something that came up with, like, fetal fetal tissues being used in uh, uh, folk medicines, I believe. Really here it is. Well. Let me let me just pull this up here so we can share this. So, yeah, you know, this, you know, and uh, people were suggesting uh, a couple of years ago that uh, Hillary might have Kuru as well, but well, interesting here. See, the thing, the thing is, I have a special stake in this because the symptoms of Kuru are related similar to, say, um, Gillian Barr syndrome, which is related to what I have, myasthenia gravis. So basically, um, the thing is with Gillian Jul Barr is they think it comes, uh, is caused by people getting vaccines. Now, if there's fetal tissue being used in vaccines, that would be akin to cannibalism. Correct. So Kuru is a disease that happens like over in like in New Guinea with, among cannibals. And it, the symptoms, if you ever see anybody suffering with Kuru, they will do things like strange laughters, uh, their jerks of their eye movements and stuff like that, um, not be able to walk quite right. They look so much like the classic, like, when people are possessed by demons that we will see in movies and stuff like that. So, and, um, and, um, and, uh, and uh, videotapes of supposed uh, actual demonic possession. So I'm thinking that 
you know, mercury would have those effects too. And uh, also aluminums um, and to some extent, soy because, you know, endocrine disruptors cause these weird things to happen in your body. And uh, so I'm thinking that a lot of this, it, that a lot of what's happening to people with rising autoimmune diseases um, that have symptoms quite like Kuru or um, the failure of the body and um, uh, you know things like uncontrollable laughter and things like that and emotional outbursts and stuff maybe um, are being caused by the addition of these substances into vaccines. Thanks. And uh, thank you, Stone, for the $5 donation just now. Thanks, everyone who supported the uh, episode tonight. We really appreciate all the support and help we can get. And uh, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to put this presentation together over the last few weeks. You know, I know it's uh, taking you a lot of work and, you know, you're, you're nervous to do the show and whatnot. So, uh, you know, we really yeah. appreciate it. We have a little bit more understanding of the of this uh, straw man form of Christianity that's been promoted as uh, Protestantism and whatnot out there. And you know, the, sorry, the the more I look at all of the Protestant religions, they, you know, congressionalism uh, or congregationalism, excuse me, Unitarianism, um, uh, Quakerism. Calvinism, etc. These were all offshoots for the corruption of Logos and what was originally Christianity, whether it was Tartary or whatever was at the core there that they suppressed and, and hid and destroyed. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, something is there. there. The issue is, is that prior to 1600, if when we look at Fomenko and we look at the creation of the the dark ages, et cetera, there's a, a wall or a curtain there that's really hard to pierce through to get a clear picture of times prior to that. You know, they uh, really did a, a thorough job in covering it up, and you really have to dig and look through, you know, old books and whatnot. But, you know, Fomenko argues that anything, what is it, uh, I think 1699, anything prior to 1699, and especially, you know, 1600 is... Uh, almost unusable because it's all of this rewrite of the history. And when, when we're going through and looking at the Salem work, you know, I've got some, some books that I found on Cotton Mather and some of these guys that discuss uh, Tartary and Tartars and, and whatnot. And then, you know, slowly over the next hundred years or so, all of that mentioned fades out. It's like this whole, you know, empire didn't exist, you know, so something is there. I know uh, people hate us talking about it and they've tried to, you know, say, don't look at that Fomenko, don't read anything he says, dismiss all of his books based on a fallacy. You know, I, I see very few people trying to address the work and figure out what's really going on. It is a big mess to get through. They've done, a you know, quite a job. You know, again, I did the series with uh, Jacob Duhlman on, on uh, Joseph Scaliger exposing all of that that I recommend people check out just to get an idea of how much they you know, they uh, messed with history and whatnot. But uh, we should probably wrap it up here. Yeah. We're, at, we're at two hours now. Did you have anything else you want to add? I just uh, want to, to, to reference something in the book of John because I think it's important. It's the final book of John. The next and time I, you got to remember to mute your phone. It's been beeping all night. Oh yeah, I have it. Have it. Uh, I have it. Yeah, let's um, just let's just read on because we're uh, we need to wrap it up here. Yeah. Um, when you we're coming to this subject, maybe we don't know what the truth is yet. But this, like at the end of John, Jesus comes to. Peter on the beach and he's going, do you love me, Peter? And the word he uses is agapeo, which means like a deep love, like, like love you would have for your kid or it's like unconditional love. And Peter replies, I'm fond of you. Then he says, do you love me, Peter? Again, that deep love. And Peter goes, 
I'm fond of you. Then Jesus says, you're fond of me, Peter? And at that point, Peter goes, you know all things. But all along, like Jesus is saying to him, feed my sheep every time. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And I take this to mean maybe we don't know the truth yet, the exact truth. But do we love the truth? Right. Are we fond of the truth? Well, the thing is, we just got to keep on trying to find it no matter what we know. You know, and here's another point, Mark, and then we'll close on this, is that, you know, we may not know the the whole truth yet and all the distortions that they created, but we're beginning to see all of the lies, and that's what's important. And, you know, when you realize that there are no contradictions in nature, that a contradiction is always, always, and without exception, a lie or an error, then it always helps you to look deeper and to know where to look rather than throwing your arms up in the air and saying opinions are like a-holes we can't know. So, um, you know, as long as we realize that a contradiction is always a lie or an error and that that's just all it means when we see a contradiction is that we need more research. And then we dig in and it slowly builds our self-confidence up to see this stuff. And then we can rebuild ourselves and our families and our society and everything else and get out of this fallen state. Thanks everyone so much for your support tonight. Please support the show, GnosticMedia.com, LogosMedia.com. I also posted up the uh, the uh, Patreon uh, thing up there on the show. I believe it's in the in the little uh, information icon above the show tonight as well. But it's at uh, Patreon Patreon.com slash LogosMedia. And uh, thank you, Mark, for participating You're tonight. Welcome. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone.